when I'm out on my bike, I, I'm very much touching nature, I suppose you could say. A lot of people refer to it as, as flying. Um, just the, the banking and the leaning the motorcycle over is probably the bit I enjoy the most. They're a lot cheaper to run than cars. Um, a lot easier to park. I enjoy being on my own on a bike. It gives me that outlet to get away and enjoy the great outdoors of Australia. Hi, I'm Wayne Gardner. Motorcycle riding is something I've done a lot of as a professional. It's also something I really enjoy doing. So I'm very keen to support and introduce this video developed by motorcyclists for motorcyclists. Throughout this video, we're going to be talking about harm and how to avoid it. Harm means any situation that causes me or someone else to get hurt. There are three things that go into good riding and avoiding harm. Bike control skills, mental skills to recognise potential harm, and self-control skills. Develop these three skills and you'll maximise your ability to avoid harm and enjoy riding. The choice is yours. Let's talk to some riders about the skills that they think are important. Obviously the basic skills of braking, swerving and um, being confident on the motorcycle but more importantly I think uh, the awareness of what's going on around you. Being able to uh, understand the motorcycle that you're on and what it's capable of. Being able to go around corners confidently and safely. A lot of common sense to be able to scan and look at what's happening all around you. There's risks in just about everything we do and there's potential risks in riding a motorcycle too. But I think it's pretty clear that good riders are the ones who combine self-control with the right mental and bike control skills to lessen those risks. This video will help you to avoid harm and help you keep on enjoying your riding for as long as possible. Your ability to deal with riding events can be helped by carrying out some basic checks every time you ride. Check out your bike before you even get onto it. This 30 second check can save you heaps and keep you alive. Look for any obvious damage. Are there any oil or fluid leaks on the ground? Look at tyres. Do a visual check to make sure they look okay, that they're inflated and there's no obvious signs of damage like cuts, nails or cracks. If you've got a chain, check the tension. Mount the bike and check your indicators, right and left. Check your stoplight, apply both the front brake and the rear. Test brakes. Check the front brake to make sure it's working. And then move the bike forward and apply the rear brake. It's important that once a week at least, you do a more thorough check. For instance, because tyres are critical for bike safety, tyre tread and pressure must be checked regularly. And if you're riding a bike with a chain, make sure the chain is lubricated, properly adjusted and not worn. Your owner's manual will show you exactly what should be checked on your bike. It will also explain any technological features your bike might have, such as special suspension systems, anti-lock or integrated brakes and traction control. Talk to your bike dealer if you're unsure about any of these features so you can maximise the safety benefit they provide. One of the most important things is, uh, is, is, is being able to uh, understand the motorcycle that you're on and what it's capable of. It may not be unusual to drive someone else's motor car, but there are much greater differences between bikes than between cars. Research shows that riders in crashes were often riding a motorcycle that they didn't own and weren't familiar with. So it's not a good idea to lend your bike to a mate or borrow someone else's. Let's go now to body checks. By law, every rider and pillion passenger must wear an Australian standards approved helmet. It should fit properly and be securely fastened. The foam on the inside compacts down over time and with wear. How much use you put it to, a helmet could last between one and five years. Frayed chin straps and worn and torn lining are indicators of age. 
Helmets are designed to absorb only one impact, so throw it away after it's done its job. And it's not recommended to buy a second-hand helmet. Got up the inside and into the lead. This is a huge ride from John Chiodo. He'll be super pleased with his position. We've got a problem. He's gone down. Oh, no. Can you believe this, Dennis? John Chiodo, a big crash. Let's have a look at what happened to him. The bike has gone sideways out of turn two. Don't try this in T-shirt and shorts. Riding gear doesn't prevent injury, but it greatly reduces it. And John Chiodo has had a big, big crash here at Phillip Island. Oh, good news, John's up. I don't think he's too happy at the moment. He'll be wondering just what's happened. Wearing good gear has benefits, but it comes at a cost. Gear that's specifically designed for motorcycle riding is the best type of gear to get. You'll need a good jacket, one that helps protect you from injury, helps you be seen, and is comfortable when riding. Don't forget some good pants. They'll help protect you from injury as well. And boots and gloves, which should be specially designed for motorcycle riding. Good gear does more than just protect you in a crash. It also helps you to enjoy motorcycling more by protecting you from the weather, dehydration and stray bits flying off the road. Also, remember to check, have you had too much to drink? Are you over the legal limit? Have you taken a drug recently, including prescription drugs? Have you had a blue with your boss, your partner, family, friends? All of these things will affect you, and so will affect your riding. If the answer is yes to any one of these, and if you do decide to ride, you're increasing your risks. Let's start with the basics of how you sit on the bike, so you have maximum control and maximum comfort. Sitting correctly will help you balance and control the bike. Feet face down and slightly out, with arches pressing on the foot pegs. Backside in the rider's part of the seat, knees gripping the tank, back reasonably straight, shoulders and arms relaxed, elbows in and slightly bent, and wrists down. Sitting correctly will have your head in a position to see what's ahead and around you. Each control on your bike must be easy to reach with hand or foot. If not, they'll need to be adjusted. That's better. It's important to adjust your mirrors. Position them so you're able to see the following traffic and the outer part of your body or bike. Make sure your head is up and eyes looking ahead. This is what you see when looking ahead and this is what you see through the mirrors. In order to see the areas which are not coloured, you need to make a head check, a look over the shoulder. You're just about ready to move off. Before you do, make a final head check. Make sure there's not a vehicle moving into the space you wish to move into. Head checks should be a habit. They need to happen even when you're not concentrating. It's 10 a.m. in the morning and the traffic is light. Let's observe this rider, looking especially at the use he makes of head checks while he's riding. I want the right lane here, so mirror, signal, Head check, changing lanes, light's been green a while, could change, I'll position the bike on the best part of the road, I'll set up, ready to stop if I have to, no safe to go through. Got a vehicle following pretty close behind me, just keeping an eye on it, slowing down, it's braking very close behind me, I'll brake it down gently, keep myself a little bit of space in front for an escape route. Lights are now green, no tow okay to continue. Just a head check there to make sure there's no bikes or anything coming up through the inside, and away we go. I need to change lanes down here, so it's going to be mirror, signal, head check. We'll do a lane change, reposition the bike, and cancel the indicator. Got a vehicle right driving in my blind spot at present. Just check over the shoulder and keep an eye on it. Need to do a lane change here, so mirror signal, check over the shoulder, readjust position, cancel the indicator. Watching that heavy vehicle closely coming in behind, I'm going to reposition the bike. Just head check there to keep an eye on that, giving myself plenty of room. Vehicle on the left, mirror, head check, reposition the bike, make sure that driver's going to stop. Yep, okay, continue through. One of the most difficult parts about cornering is uh, eye direction. Instead of 
looking down and at the ground in front of the motorcycle, which is just an automatic reaction. You want to do that. You have to try and look further ahead of the motorcycle where you want the bike to go. Notice that when the rider wants to go left, he looks left. And then right when he wants to go right. The use of the eyes to look at where you want to go has a direct relationship with the handlebars. The same principle applies to obstacles in your path, like objects or potholes. If you notice an approaching object, don't allow your eyes to stay on it, or you might hit it. Register its position in your mind, then look in the direction you wish to go. Your head movements are critical also when cornering. Notice that as this rider gets into the curve, his body is leaning into it. His head is upright and his line of sight through the turn is level with the road. It's fairly common for inexperienced riders to drop their bikes in low speed braking situations, such as driveways, petrol stations, shopping centres and car parks. This can lead to injuries like strained backs and broken ankles. It's also really embarrassing and can cause expensive damage to your bike. If you're off your bike and need to brake, you'll have to use the front brake, but make sure you point the front wheel straight ahead. A common fault when riding at walking speeds or very low speeds is to use the front brake harshly when the handlebars are turned. This causes the bike to drop forward and will probably topple it. Look at this rider's method and see if you can work out what he's doing right. He's keeping the bike upright with handlebar straight ahead. He's braking straight and braking gently. He's using the rear brake to slow down, allowing him to keep control and balance. Because at walking speed, he doesn't need the force of the front brake. Low speed turning is not as easy as it might seem. The thing to remember is the slower you go, the more you have to compensate for the weight of the bike. Notice how the rider is looking in the direction he wants to go. He's turning the bike by leaning out of the turn, using the back brake exclusively. He may also have to work the clutch to prevent stalling. We've learned how to control the bike at very low speeds to avoid harm. Now let's look at the bike control skills you need at higher speeds to avoid harm. There are two main skills you'll need. The skill to stop the bike before a hazard, which is usually the safer option, and the skill for moving around a hazard, which may be your only way out if you fail to anticipate the hazard. We'll look at what you have to do to move around something first. Later we'll see how you can avoid situations like this altogether. Let's say these cones are a hazard, like the car pulling out, and you haven't given yourself room to stop safely. We'll play that again and look at the technique he used. There are two main parts to it, looking and pushing. Look where you want to go and push the handlebar on the side you want to go. Your other hand can pull. When you push the handlebar, this momentarily steers the bike off your intended course, forcing the bike to lean in the direction you want to go. So if you want to go to the right, you look right, push right, and go right. If you want to go to the left, you look left, push left, and go left. Once the swerve has started, relax the push and steer straight. If you want to go to the right and then to the left, you guessed it, push right, push left. Push gently and you'll move away gently. Push quickly and you'll move away quickly, providing you have good tyre grip. On a slippery surface, you wouldn't be able to do this. With practice, you can get quite good. You'll learn to make it a smooth action by pivoting at the hips and keeping your weight on the pegs to assist control. But this is on a training range. It's not quite as easy on the road. This rider was relying as much on luck as skill to avoid a crash. If the car had moved a fraction later, it would have been a different story. Let's look at how a good rider applies the brakes while on the road. Swerving to avoid harm is an option, but not one we can rely on. You should plan to have room to stop. 
This rider was ready for the turning car and used his brakes well. But what if he hadn't been ready? Chances are he would have frozen up and not braked at all, or grabbed and locked the brakes. These are the most common surprise reactions. This sort of braking would probably have ended in a crash. The car did pull out in front of me, but if I had have responded well, it wouldn't have been an issue at all, whereas I responded badly and panicked and grabbed the front brake and, and actually fell off the motorcycle and didn't even get anywhere near the car. But um, I suppose that was the first time that I realised that cars could actually turn in front of you, and that was a little bit scary. Before we go to good braking, we'll look at what you should do if you skid. If you lock the front wheel, release the brake immediately. Then reapply the brakes smoothly. If you lock the rear wheel, steer the bike straight if it's out of line and then release the brake pressure. In any kind of skid, keep both feet up on the foot pegs. This may take a bit of willpower, but it will give you the best control. Once more. Front wheel, release the brake immediately and reapply gently. Rear wheel, bike in line, release the brake and reapply gently. Good riders rarely put themselves in emergency situations. They try to anticipate trouble and they know how to brake well. Understanding braking is, is essential on a motorcycle. It's probably one of the, I, th I think, one of the most important things. To understand the best method for braking, let's first look at the effect braking has on a bike. As we brake, the weight of the bike starts to move from both wheels to mostly the front wheel. The harder the bike stops, the more weight transfers to the front. When the weight transfers progressively, it lets the front tyre grip the road more. The tyre has a bigger footprint on the road. At the same time, rear tyre grip is reduced. To stop quickly, you need good grip. Because of this, there's a limit to the amount of work the rear brake can do. In good conditions, the front brake provides nearly all your stopping power. We'll look at a braking demonstration. The rider on the right is only using the back brake. The rider in the middle is using the front brake only. And the rider on the left is using both brakes together. Notice how the rider using the back brake alone takes by far the longest distance to stop. The rider using both brakes together stops in the shortest space. Using both brakes together is clearly the most effective way to stop. Now let's look at the two parts of good braking, set up and squeeze. The first part, setting up, prepares you and the bike for braking. Apply the front brake and back brake levers just until the brakes start to work. This stage takes all the slack out of the braking and suspension systems, and as we've seen, gently delivers more weight onto the front tyre, giving it more grip. Also, your brake light is on, telling the person behind you may be going to stop. Your bike is set up to brake hard. Now comes the second part of good braking, the squeeze. Progressively squeeze the brake levers, gently at first, then gradually harder and harder to stop the bike. The front and rear brakes work powerfully together to slow the bike safely. We'll look at the parts one more time. Set up, then squeeze. Good riders will brake like this every time they brake, so good braking becomes a habit. Good braking habits will help you in an emergency. Now let's look at how a good rider applies the brakes while on the road. Whenever I ride a bike, I always check the brakes out first. Each bike's just so different. I need to know how much slack's in the levers and how well each brake works. Every time I brake, I'm going to set up and squeeze. Sign indicates roundabout ahead. I can see the roundabout now. There's a pedestrian crossing there, a lot of white markings on the road. I'm going to do my best to avoid them. Turning right, mirror signal, Set the brakes up early, squeezing gently. Checking the view to the right, got vehicles coming in through there. Just wait for them. The front brake's a stopping brake, but on some surfaces you've got to use it really gently. Gravel right ahead, set up, squeeze firm on the bitumen, ease off and reapply gently. There's less grip. Also helps moving onto gravel to keep the weight on the pegs and ease out of the seat. That helps with bike control. It's the same in the wet, you've got to be real gentle on the brakes. You can't squeeze either brake as hard. 
set up long before you normally would to get the brakes working and squeeze gently it'll take you more room to stop set up squeeze and stop on really slippery surfaces there's no braking at all because there's almost no grip I'll keep the bike upright wait on the pegs and use gentle acceleration For curves, do your braking before entering the turn. Set up, squeeze, off brakes. You can't brake firmly on this angle because tyre grip's being used up for cornering. If you make a mistake and have to brake firmly, bike upright and squeeze. See the dangerous position that's put me in. That's why it's so important to brake to a safe speed before entering the corner. On a bike, braking is your main survival method. Good braking, set up and squeeze is not a natural instinct. It's a bike skill that has to be learned then practiced over and over, even when you think you may have mastered it. Braking is a vital part of the total riding package. So now you're up and moving. Remember the basics. Head checks. Cover your blind spots and keep your head moving all the time. Changing directions. Look there, go there. And braking. Set up and squeeze smoothly, using mostly the front brake. In this segment of the video, we'll look at developing the mental skills to recognise the potential for harm accurately. It will let you know how to avoid getting hurt or hurting someone else. And on a motorcycle, I suppose because you are more exposed, there is that large element of risk. If you do come off, then you're likely to be injured. When I started riding, there were, there were no rider training courses. It took me so much longer to get my skill levels up uh, compared to what, what people can do nowadays the conditions are changing, the elements are changing, and you have to change and work with those elements to, to reduce the amount of risk for you at all possible times. You know? If we're able to recognise risk accurately, we don't need to be told what to do. We avoid the edge of the cliff. We keep away from the danger. It's no different on a bike. Surviving is about keeping away from danger, usually by slowing down or moving away. I thought about it because I really thought the car was in the wrong, the driver of the car. But in actual fact, I was because I was in his blind spot and there wasn't any way that he could have seen that I was there. This lady was on her mobile phone and she's um, gone off into the gravel and flicked up a few stones. And um, in hindsight, what I perhaps should have done was backed off a little bit and make there be uh, more distance between myself and her. Perhaps you already have the bike skills to protect yourself, but you also need the mental skills. The mental skills for recognising what you should be slowing down or moving away for and exactly when you should be doing it. If you slow down and move away too early, you might hold up other traffic or confuse other drivers. If you're too late slowing down or moving away, you might not have enough room to avoid crashing. As a guide to safe, smooth riding, you need to be preparing to protect yourself at least three seconds before an event. If your mind is on the job and the riding conditions are good, three seconds gives you time to react and stop smoothly if you have to, or time to reposition your bike. Let's look at how you can calculate when you are three seconds from an event. Select a stationary point in front of you and guess when you think you are three seconds away. Then count. 1001, 1002, 1003. If you've passed your selected point before you get to the end of 1003, you need to give yourself more room. Here's the three seconds projected in front of the bike at 60 kilometres an hour. We can call this our survival space. When you go faster, the three second space gets longer. You need more survival space because it takes longer to stop and you'll need more room to manoeuvre. When you slow, the space gets shorter. That's OK. The brakes have less work to do and you need less room to manoeuvre. For adverse conditions, you'll need at least another second possibly more. To survive you need to protect this space. If you don't, you're putting yourself at risk. 
like this rider. He hasn't responded to the car on the right or the car on the left. If either driver moves off now, the rider will have very little time or space to avoid a crash. Look, slow down or move away. These are the habits you need to develop to avoid harm. We'll watch this rider follow these steps. She'll be looking for anything that could enter her survival space. The first thing will be this car at the intersection. By the time the rider's survival space reaches this car, she should be getting ready to slow down or move away or maybe both. Let's hear what she's thinking. All right, now there's a car approaching the side street on the left. No one behind me. I'll set up the brakes, move right to create a survival space. Let's continue to follow the rider in a busy street. Notice how she looks carefully, scanning all around so she has plenty of time to respond to anything that could enter her survival space. All right, now I'm checking my mirrors. The lights are green, they could change. There's further pedestrians over on the left, a car with its right indicator on. Caution through the intersection and try and make eye contact with the person in the white Ford. Now let's look at the rider in a number of different situations. All right, I'm checking my mirrors. The traffic's a fair way behind me. The lights are green, so I'll continue cautiously. Now I'm looking at that blue car on the left. Its lane's going to run out, so at this rate he'll merge into my survival space. I'd better drop back and let him in. Right, now he's in front. I'll check my three second gap and then continue. All right, now I'm checking my mirrors. There's a car passing on my right. I'm in his blind spot now. He can't see me in his mirror and he could do a lane change. I'll check my mirrors, drop back and be ready. Let's look at how to deal with a hill crest. I'm looking at this hill crest coming up. Can't see what's on the other side. The main concern is vehicles coming the other way. Better move towards the left. The rider is approaching a left-hander. He's positioned himself to maximise his view around a corner, but he can't see through to the end of it. There could be anything around there, including a car coming the other way. He backs off, changes down, and gets his space back. The rider is approaching a right-hand corner. He's positioning himself for the best view and looking for the end of the curve. He may meet a vehicle coming around the corner, so he keeps away from the middle of the road. He gives himself some room on the left as well. Good riders use a variety of methods to fine-tune their cornering, but protecting their survival space comes first. Now that we've seen a rider look for and respond to potential harm, you have a go. Let's follow this rider. We'll pause each time the rider's safety is threatened. You look for the threat and work out the best response. Try to do this before we pause. Can you see the threat? The vehicle on the left is going to come across and take the rider's lane, moving into his survival space. What does the rider do? Check mirror and ease back. A new threat. The vehicle on the left coming up from the side road may come through. The rider's action, check mirror, set up brakes, moving slightly toward the centre but not too far as there's an oncoming vehicle, and continue. A lot happening here. A vehicle on the left, two pedestrians on the right, and a heavy vehicle coming down the centre with a smaller vehicle hidden behind it. Brakes are set up and the rider moves to the centre, not too far to the left. The threat? A heavy vehicle turning and a vehicle on the right that could come out wide. Also an oncoming vehicle further back. The rider's action is to reposition to the left and continue. A slippery surface, a crash up ahead. People could step out from the broken down vehicle which may itself move. And the vehicle on the right has cut across into the rider's lane invading his survival space. The rider checks mirrors, sets up and repositions to the left.
A vehicle on the left which may or may not push out. The rider checks mirrors, sets up and positions himself to the right. Looking ahead, there are parked cars in the rider's lane. He'll want to move right, but must be watchful of vehicles coming through. The rider checks mirrors, signals, head checks over his shoulder and continues on. A school crossing area and work vehicles, one partly blocking the road. It doesn't seem hazardous, but it's possible that school kids or workmen may come out and enter the rider's survival space. The rider checks mirror, sets up brakes and moves toward the centre of the road. He is well prepared to respond to the possible threats. So remember, whenever you're riding, always create and maintain your three second survival space and keep away from danger by slowing down and moving away. In the previous segments, we've looked at the bike control skills you need and the mental skills to recognise harm. In this segment, let's look at the vital third link in the harm triangle, the ability to exercise self-control. For most people, riding is more than just an economical means of transport. There's another dimension to it. It feels good. Let's call this the fun and freedom factor. Probably the hardest thing about riding is having the self-control to keep this fun and freedom factor in check. There's a fine line between enjoying your riding and taking high risks without thinking things through. Self-control skills are very important on the road because you've got to be disciplined as a rider. You've got to be aware of everything around you all the time. Do a lot of silly things, overtaking vehicles when other incoming vehicles are coming through, yeah. Taking the odd one or two chances in life, yeah. Well, it is a good feeling, especially if it pays off. Like, if you pop a good wheel stand, well, you know, you feel pretty good, but then if you flip it, you're in a lot of trouble. And the slides, the slides are usually good, and they've got a good feeling, of, I guess, they're adrenaline pumping, but that's the same thing with that. If, if it let go, you'd be in a lot of trouble. There is a certain element of that peer pressure, especially when you're riding with friends and some of them aren't going faster than you. And I think initially I used to get really caught up in that and try and you know, get closer and closer and, and ride as fast as other people. But I suppose maybe it's an age thing. As you get older, you realise that, you know, your limits. And so now I find that I don't have that urge to keep up as much. I just enjoy the riding and go as fast as I feel comfortable. But, but that's a hard thing to do because some days, you know, someone overtakes you and, and does those sort of things and you want to keep up. And like everyone goes to that stage where they want to show off in front of their friends. But um, I suppose we have you know, a few times just done stupid things, but usually someone in the, in the group will pull you into line. I, I try to think of the expense of the bike, trying to fix it if I, if I come off and then myself in hospital and time off work and things like that. That's how I try to keep myself in control. In this segment, we'll look at how to keep a safe balance between enjoying your riding and high risk riding. We'll give you some ideas on how to stay in control of yourself so you can enjoy riding as long as you like, rather than remember riding used to be. What do we mean by high-risk riding? It's when we put ourselves in a position where we depend upon luck to get us through or where one mistake can cost us big time. It's when we put ourselves in a potentially dangerous situation to get some minor benefit. We might do this deliberately or without thinking. As you can see from this risk meter, at the moment the risk is low. Now this is higher risk riding. As the rider approaches the curve, his visibility is reduced. He doesn't back off enough, so he's increasing his level of risk. It's potentially dangerous. A car cutting the corner, gravel on the road, a strip of water or just about anything could be in the rider's survival space. And the rider is risking a crash. Taking this level of risk, what's in it for the rider? 
What's the so-called benefit? Some riders might say the excitement or being seen as a quick rider. Here's another example. A potentially dangerous situation. Though the car driver should stop here, if he doesn't, the rider might not be able to avoid crashing. How has this riding action benefited the rider? It saved a bit of effort, maybe. The effort of slowing down and moving away. But he was risking his life to do that. And this is risk-taking, too. It's potentially dangerous because if the car stops suddenly, the rider will crash into it. What's the benefit? The rider would probably say it means no one else gets the space. But he was risking a crash to do that. In serious single vehicle crashes, more often than not, alcohol is involved. The rider was over the limit. Combining alcohol, drugs and riding is extremely dangerous. Risk taking is putting ourselves in potentially dangerous situations, risking a crash, risking injury and even death for some benefit. The so-called benefit of getting there quicker, being accepted, looking cool, whatever. So how do we keep in control? As riders, we don't have to park the bike in the shed and grow old with it. The first step in making decisions about risk-taking is accepting that we have to look after our own survival, not hand it over to other road users or leave it to luck. So instead of thinking, bloody idiot took me out, there was stuff all I could do about it, we could instead say, I let him into my survival space. If I'd been more awake, I would have seen him and got out of the way, but I didn't give myself enough time to react. Now, this sort of response takes some self-control. It's a, there must have been something I could have done attitude to riding, which is great for learning more about risks, because it helps us learn from every mistake. I went into that corner too fast. Missed seeing that. Got to take more notice of the road surface. Moved in too early on that one. That's a dumb place to sit. I should have realised the driver wouldn't have been able to see me. If we guard our survival space so no cars or other road users can get into it, and the road surface is good, we're keeping down our level of risk. When a situation is riskier, slow down or move away from the danger. Thoughtful riding makes bike control look easy. But it also takes self-control, quite a bit of it. Even with some self-control, there'll be times when other thoughts or feelings push your risk meter up too high. Let's look at a Sunday ride with a group of mates. A sunny day, great curves, great views. What could be better? Something inside is pushing. Something is encouraging us to take unacceptable risks. We want to be first to the chequered flag. Maybe we're too lazy to put on protective clothing. We want to be young and carefree, rediscover our youth. We think we should keep up with our mates. We feel the need to prove ourselves, even if it means taking unnecessary risks. These are feelings that aren't easy to deal with. We've all felt them at one time or another. My most worst mistake ever was I ran, um, came around a corner too fast in the wet one day and as I came around the corner there was a diesel on the road. And I, I, I smelt the uh, diesel a split second before the front end of the bike disappeared and my next recollection was the bike spinning around in front of me as I lay on my backside sliding across the road. You live and learn I guess. Now when it rains I just back off a little bit extra. If it's a beautiful sunny day and you're out riding with friends it's very easy to get a bit carried away and, and you know go enjoying the moment and all that sort of thing. Let's look at a plan we can use to keep the fun and freedom factor under control. The plan has two parts. First, look at ourselves riding. And second, consider the choices open to us. Let's look at ourselves riding and watch the situations we get ourselves into. This might be in curves, in traffic, or with mates. Once we have recognised the risk-taking situation, go to the next step. Consider the choices that are open to us. One. Choose the potential danger and high risk and how this benefits you. Or two, choose a safe alternative and the benefits of this choice. Let's consider the potential danger in the high risk approach. Take a look at these bikes from a local repair shop. This one crashed at 60 kilometres an hour. It will cost around $4,000 to fix. 
This bike crashed at 40 kilometres an hour. It's a total write-off. We all know that repairing or replacing a bike is expensive, far too expensive. And the human cost can't be measured in dollars. Not all crashes have this outcome. But there's a chance we'll fall off our bikes at some stage. What are the so-called benefits in the high-risk approach to riding? Saving some effort by not slowing down and moving away? Looking cool? Being seen to be quick? And so on. Are these real benefits? Is it worth getting injured or worse? I think the biggest trap is being caught into travelling too fast, trying to keep up with the other bloke. Yeah, if I was riding with a group of people and they took off, I'd probably stop and <laughs> have a cigarette. <laughs> because I've had a couple of mates killed on the road, so it doesn't actually make you ride a little bit care more careful. Um, actually, as we ride as a group, we actually ride very sensibly. Now consider the safe alternative and its benefits. Save you heaps of money, save you all the aggro, no painful injuries, no grief for family and friends, no downside. The safe alternative can take a lot of self-control, but it will help us enjoy riding for as long as we want to ride. You've just seen how to make calculated decisions about risk taking. The choice is yours. You can choose the high risk or the low risk alternative. Look at yourself riding and consider the choices. If you want a long and enjoyable life riding your bike, choose the low risk every time. <laughs>